Good evening. Welcome to the Cambridge University Press sponsored webinar, Jamboard Drawing and Slides. Jenny and I are so happy to have Maureen Lamb return as our guest presenter this evening. Um, as you know, uh, Maureen is a certified Google trainer. So that means she is an expert at all things Google. And uh, she did a wonderful webinar for us the beginning of January uh, on an overview of different ways to use the Google suite. And tonight she is going to delve into uh, three things specifically, as you can see, Jamboard drawing and slides. And uh, she will uh, give you some more in-depth uh, information and templates, et cetera, that hopefully you can put to good use uh, pretty quickly in your classroom. Uh, she teaches at Kingswood Oxford School in West Hartford, Connecticut, and she's the language department chair there, as well as the academic technology coordinator. Uh, we are recording this webinar, and the link will be posted uh, in a couple of places in a few days. Uh, we have it on the NACCP website, which is cambridgelatin.org. It's also on the uh, cambridge.org YouTube channel. And uh, if you need a professional development certificate, please contact us and we will get one to you as soon as possible. And Maureen. Hi everyone, welcome tonight. Today we're going to be going over Jamboard drawing and slides. And I can still see you even though you're tiny on my screen. So quick show of hands, who's used Jamboard before? You can use your little reactions too if that helps. Who's used uh, drawing before? Okay, good, good. We have some experts here. And who's used Google Slides? And if you went to my other presentation, you know they're my favorite. So we're gonna be doing some fun Google Slides things today. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, if you want to follow along, so I won't read everything that's here because you already said it, but if you'd like to follow along the slide deck on your own, please feel free to go to tinyurl.com slash 4FLN. 6GMT. Tiny URL is no longer free. And so <laughs> you can't get the custom ones as easily. So I'll be looking into that. I didn't realize that. So again, that's 4FLN6GMT if you want to follow along. I just put it in the chat box so you can copy it. Thank you, Ginny. That's what I do. <laughs> All right. So we're going to get started with Google Drawings. One of the reasons I like Google Drawings a lot is that they can be embedded. So you can embed them into a Google site. You can embed them into a non-Google site very easily by publishing them to the web. You can insert them into a Google Doc or Google Slides as a picture, which is pretty cool. You can insert them as images in Jamboard. That's pretty much my favorite thing to do with them these days is make something cool in Google Drawings and then put it in Jamboard it's for students to draw all over. Uh, they can use these backgrounds too. So not just for Jamboard, but for other things. So let's go over some ways to do this. So first, who here has a custom header for Google Classroom? Ooh, this is something you can do in Google Drawing if you haven't already. So I'm gonna show you how to do this with, um, let me just stop share of this for a second so I can, oh, you know what? I'll just, oh, don't go backwards, hold up. Let me pull that up. So let's get a new drawing here. And the way you're going to do this is you're gonna follow these directions. So first you go to page setup. So you go to file and then you go to page setup. And it's going to look like you have very limited options, but you can go to custom. And so you're going to want to change it here, not to inches, but to pixels. And so you're going to want it to change it to 2000 by 400 pixels. And then you're going to have a Google drawing box that's going to fit really well as a Google header. So you can make a custom header for your website or a custom header for your Google Classroom. And you can do any sort of background you want, but just a couple of caveats. If you're going to use a big picture as the background, it might get very pixelated. So I would recommend choosing kind of a blank background. So let's say, I don't know, I'm gonna choose this. I'm gonna make this the same shape. 
I'm gonna make it a pretty color. And then I might put, I might put little images in there. So maybe I wanna do one tiny image of a Roman. Let's see what comes up when I put in Roman. Oh, interesting. There we go. I'll pick you and put that in there. And so it's usually better with tinier images. So you can use multiple tiny images to get a really good effect and then keep your text large. So you want to make it really nice and big so that everyone can see. Magistra Agna. And then I may want to do a couple of other little pictures. Just kind of a fun way to customize your Google Classroom and make it fun. Okay, let's go back to present. Any questions on how to do that? Again, feel free to go back to the tiny URL link if you want to look for the directions for this. If you make a cool one, please share it with me. I would absolutely love to see it. Another thing you might want to do in Google Drive is to make a graphic organizer. And like I said, what I've been doing a lot with Google Drawing is making a graphic organizer or something like that, and then putting that template in Jamboard so that my students can go through and um, edit it the way they want to. So let's take a look at this. So here's an example. So this would be an example of my students trying to do an essay. And so I start essays way back in Latin too, and kind of go all the way through because I think it's important that students find their textual evidence and figure out how to do it. So here I have a thesis statement and this is all editable for students on Jamboard because what I do is I take text box once I insert this as an image in Jamboard and put a text box in each of these boxes. So students can write what they're doing. And the cool part for me is I can pop through all their jams and see what they're writing. So as they're doing their brainstorming for their essay, which I created on Jamboard, on Google Drawing, I can pop through the jam boards and see what they're writing and give them feedback on what they're writing. So it's really cool. And the thing, the reason why I used Google Drawing and not Jamboard for this is there's a temptation or perhaps by accident to move things around on Jamboard. So if I make something like this and I create it as an image and then put it on Jamboard, then the students can't move around the background. So I find that's very, very helpful. And so how do I make a graphic organizer? It's actually way simpler than it looks. And some of you may already know how to do this. And some of you might be expert at this already, but we'll just go over it. So make a nice background. You can use an image for a background. You can use a nice color for a background, however you wanna do it. I, love, I tend to do a lot of black backgrounds with kind of bright foregrounds, just depending on how you wanna do it. And I would recommend using shapes versus text boxes because text boxes tend to elongate and widen a little bit too much for my taste. I'd rather use a shape than type within the shape. Unfortunately, that you don't have that capacity in Jamboard yet, but I hope it's coming around the corner. We'll see. So you could add a shape and make it what you want and add a color to that shape. And then you could type right in that shape. Now I've had students do all sorts of graphic organizing things and infographic type things, which I'll show you next. But I've had them do timelines on here. I've had them add pictures for different things. I've had students create kind of their idea flowchart for projects. I have students do what's kind of a genius hour project, but I like to call it a fun 45 because I don't really like the word genius. So students have 45 minutes a week for eight weeks to work on a project of their choice. And I like to see how they're brainstorming for the project. So they can brainstorm and show me how they're brainstorming any way they want, but they have to use pictures and text boxes and just kind of describe how they're thinking about things. And it's fun because they can add, they can add videos, they can add um, links to this. Ooh, that's another thing. If you want to add a video to Google Drawing, you will notice there is no insert video. However, this is a little trick. From within here, if you insert a video in, oh, here we go. If you, oops, it's not letting me click out. Let's see, escape. Nope, it's not letting me, there we go. So if I were to insert a video into Google Slides, so 
this is coming up later. So just get excited there. Everything is awesome. Um, what you can do is copy. I just did Command C on my Mac. And then I'm gonna go into the graphic organizer and do Command V and it appears. It's a trick. It's not actually something that you can do. So it's kind of a secret backward shortcut. So if you insert something in Google Slides like that, you can copy it over to Google Drive. But as you will see, there is no way to insert it otherwise. Okay, fun trick for the night. Okay. Oh, hello, everything is awesome. You're back. We can get rid of you. Oh, nope, it's gonna play you. There we go. Oh no. Hey. Everything is awesome. It just wants to play it. Here we go. Infographic. <laughs> oh, I see a question in the chat. No, that was just me putting something in. Oh, okay, great. Oh, I <laughs> here's a sample infographic. Tips for translation. These uh, are, are, are probably stolen from people wiser than I am, but it's really what I tell my students. First, read the whole sentence. Don't read it one word at a time. It's like that old joke when the person walks in late to the Senate house and he says, hey, what's Cicero talking about? The other guy says, I don't know, he hasn't gotten to the end of the sentence yet. So don't <laughs> tell him to go punting and pecking for the verb. Read the whole sentence first. Then what is the subject of that sentence? What is the action of the sentence? And what words do you recognize? Those are my big hints. This is something I might give to Latin too, so I don't have a lot of hunting and pecking for the verb. So a little infographic that may help them to understand what's going on um, and dissuade them from doing other things or use wonderful Google Translate, which tends to think that Latin is French, which is so funny. If you have Google Translate installed in your Google Chrome and you go to the Latin library, it says, do you want to translate this into French? Try it sometime. It's very funny. Um, it has nothing to do with the Latin, but again, it's good amusement. Okay. Next, who loves Rota? Rota is so much fun. I like it. It's like, it's kind of like checkers. It is. So here's a wonderful Rota board you can use. And by the way, all of these are linked in the presentation. So feel free to copy and take whatever you want. No attribution necessary, just have, oops, just have fun. So what you can do is have someone place these little dots, see, Ooh, they're shapes so they move nicely. And I just moved the whole board, that was my problem. There we go. So these little shapes move nicely for the Rota board. You can move them onto different spots. Ooh. And I'm cheating, I'm making myself like win already, but almost like tic-tac-toe actually, yeah. So moving these, so they can move this around. And I tend to, if I'm going to do this, I would assign a Rota board to two players and then have them play. And so that can be fun to do an authentic Roman game. Well, authentic as digital Roman games can go, but Ma a fun thing to do for hybrid learning. Maureen, is there a way to lock the a lot the large box in down so it can't move? Like you just moved it? Yeah. So what I usually do is usually I'll take this Google drawing and I will make it a picture and then okay. share it and then put the things on top of it. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, thank you. You saw, you're seeing like the part I work on, but if I were gonna share this with my students, I would take a screenshot of this and then I would put the little things on top of it. That's an excellent question. And so you can see there's, an, there's a Rota board from ancient Roman times, it looks well used. And this is where I have the everything is awesome. So if you want to, who here has seen the Lego movie? Totally. Yeah, I have a four and a six year old. So we have definitely seen the Lego movie and we like the song, Everything is Awesome. So I was, I don't know about you, but my students sometimes need a real brain break this year. This year has been tough. So sometimes I'll have them make something. And in the spirit of mosaics, I've been having them build with like Legos here. And what you can do is pull the Legos on here. You can also duplicate Legos very quickly by doing um, control or command C and V. So you can have bunches of Legos 
And all you have to do is really make it the same size as the board. Again, feel free to steal this and use it in whatever way and just have them make something. Maybe instead of having them draw something when you're reading something, have them make something out of Legos. Some students will be very into that and very excited for the opportunity. Um, so I know some, some of my students would much rather draw, build something with Legos, even fake Legos, than draw something. And I do a lot of drawing because I, like I like students to show that they understand the material in ways other than translating. So I try, not that translation's bad, not that I don't always do, I, not that I don't do translation ever, but I think it's important for them to be able to show things. So have them make an arch out of these or have them make a, I don't know, a sailboat or something like that, something fun for that. It looks um, like a question in the chat. You have a question. Do you do Legos in drawing? Yes, I do Legos in drawing. You could also do it in Jamboard if you wanted to. Um, I would create it in drawing and then transfer everything over to Jamboard probably. And to clarify for me, you made those, you took, you basically made pictures of all those different pieces of Lego. Yep, that's right. Okay. So now I like you should copy mine and not spend a lot of time making yours. <laughs> no, what I'm thinking about is people have always wanted to do some kind of mosaic when they get to fish porn. Exactly. One of the problems is either you use little pieces of paper, beads, or you go crazy. And this piece takes that out of it. You you've got the colors in the pieces, now do something. Yeah. Right. And that's actually what I want to go over next. So this is a good way to have students do mosaics. And the other type of way. I've had students do mosaics in the past is step, thir step 13 <laughs> is to be everything is awesome. Uh, <laughs> so the next way to do it is just take a regular old Google drawing and have students get creative, have them make a mosaic out of pictures or out of shapes if they want to insert shapes if they want to insert pictures. Um, they can do their own things if they wanted to do it more like a traditional mosaic. They could insert shapes and kind of do a bunch of different types of shapes too. So let's say you want to do you want to do one that's shaped like that. Let's say you want to do just a bunch of them, and you could just duplicate these and make them a bunch of different colors. So this is another way that students could do mosaics. So let's say I'll have one square that's this color. Maybe I'll copy that, and then I'll make it another color. Again, easier than making an actual physical mosaic, but it takes some time and planning to do something like this. And so having students do this, it can have them get the idea of what it might be like to do a mosaic, especially right now in hybrid learning for many of us, it's, you can't use physical things, but this is some way you could get students to really interact with that. And when I've done something like this, students almost always want to do like a dog or something. They love the Kawe Kadam um, <laughs> little thing. So it's just fun. And I think in, in this time too, it's so nice to do this as a brain break and say, okay, now time to work on your mosaic for five minutes. Just give them some downtime, something where they're doing something kinesthetic, where they're moving stuff around. It can be very, very helpful for students. And next we're gonna do Google Slides. Are there any questions about Google Drawing before we move on? Okay, and if you have any questions after this and you want to reach out to me, my email is latintechtools at gmail.com and I'm very happy to share all of these. So if you want a copy that you can work off of, let me know. So we're going to talk about Google Slides. And if you went to my last presentation, you know Google Slides are my favorite. And the reason they're my favorite is because you can link slides to slides and do so much with them. You can also insert videos and pictures very easily. And I find that personally, they're great for organizing. Um, I showed my wayfinding doc that I do for my students last time, but now I'm gonna show a little bit about how they can organize a class period. So this is one that I just started out doing, which is super fun. Who here has done a station rotation model? Okay, I have found this very helpful, especially on remote days to do something a little bit different with students. So this would be a do it now dice. So you click on the video to play the dice rolling, their virtual dice, then press pause and it will give you a number. Wherever the dice stops, click on that dice below. Then do the activity on that slide. Then after 10 minutes, go to the dice page and roll again until you get a new number. 
then do the activity on that side for the next 10 minutes. And I do 75 minute blocks. So there are lots of time for activities. So this can be a really fun way to have students working in new groups, to have students get some kind of small group time with the teacher, to have students do some independent work that they need to do and all sorts of things. So here is the dice roll page. Ooh, let's see which one I get. I would make a copy for each student. Usually I would have all students on a slide deck at the same time, but for something like this, each student would have their own copy. All right, let's roll the dice. Let's see what we get. Oh, it doesn't want to roll. Oh, I know why. It'll only do it if I'm presenting it. Right. All right, now you'll be kind to me. Oh, what are we gonna get? We're gonna get number six. Let's go see what number six is. Can you all see this? Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Flipgrid. So respond to the discussion question, then respond either to Mrs. Lamb's response or one of your classmates' responses. Do you agree or disagree? Why or why not? And here they have a wonderful little timer that will tell them exactly how much time they have left in that station. So they can time themselves, which is super helpful. They can also join Zoom room number three, which is the quiet room. It's a quiet breakout room they can go join so that they can be in a place where everyone has their cameras off and they're muted. Because in the main room, things might be chaotic. In room one, people will be meeting with me. In room two, people who want to collaborate with each other will be hanging out. And I love now that Zoom has made it so that students can move between rooms mm -hmm. so that they can pick their own room. So Zoom one is meeting with Mrs. Lamb, Zoom two is collaboration, and Zoom three is the quiet room. It reminds me of the quiet, room, the quiet car on the train when you want to get work done and you don't want to talk to people. That's a good one. Um, yes, you can do it with breakout rooms with Google Meet as well. Yes, I don't think the students could choose their own rooms for Google Meet. I think you would have to place the students. But what you could do to make it easier is have students say which room they want to go to in the chat and then put those names in the room. Before Zoom changed so that students could choose their own room, I have students say, I wanna to go to room one, work with Mrs. Lamb. I wanna to go to room two to work with others. I wanna to go to room three. And they just put the number in the chat. So it was very easy to organize where students were going. That's a great question. Okay. All right, back to the beginning. Let's see. Oh, it, well, let me go back. Oh, here are the other options. So let's say I rolled. Ah, there we go. Oh, nope. So if you roll a one, you meet with me. Yay. And so the question room with Mrs. Lamb, you get to ask me questions and they'll have a mini grammar review and context. So the idea is everyone will do one of these rooms in my 75 minute block. And again, I'll press the timer and make sure they get out of there when they need to. Next, meeting with colleagues. Again, they'll put the timer on, they'll collaborate with each other, and they'll be filling out an interview jam board, which I will show you in a few minutes. And they'll ask each other questions. Again, they're in room two, collaboration room. I don't know. Room three is doing a pair deck. So they can go to, oh, sorry, dice three is a pair deck. So they can go to the quiet room to fill out their pair deck. This would be an asynchronous pair deck. So they would not all be on the same slide at the same time. Paul is saying, I open additional meets in new tabs with simple nicknames. Students can then choose which rooms to join. That's a great idea. Absolutely. God addresses Let's that. that. Absolutely. Next, students will do a Quizlet. They'll go to the class Quizlet folder that we have. And we're in unit, we're stage 21 at the same time, at this time. So complete the Quizlets for unit 21 using review or games or play Quizlet with classmates. So here they can opt for either Zoom room two if they wanted to do a Quizlet live or they could opt for Zoom three if they wanted to work by themselves and have quiet time. Again, making sure they turn on that timer. And I'll remind them over Zoom, but sometimes they don't pay as much attention. So it's nice to have the timer. Next, have students play GimKit. Does anyone else play GimKit? Oh my goodness, my students are obsessed. It's wonderful. They really engage with it. It's so much fun. I'm very impressed with the way they've been using GimKit and they're very excited for, um, what's it called? The one that's like Among Us coming back next week. 
<laughs> so it's really fun. And so here again, they can choose between Zoom Room 2 so that they can play with their classmates or Zoom Room 3 if they wanted to play by themselves. Here in the chat, we have, oh, tell no one. Thank you, Kate. That's right. Tell no one. They're super excited. We got the countdown going. Oh, and then that was six. That was the one we went to. And that's it for that. So that's a really fun new thing I've been doing with station rotation model that I find has been working out really well for hybrid learning. So that's been a really fun one. That one's probably the most involved because I have to think of six new things every time. And sometimes I just don't have the energy for that. So I have um, two other ones that are fun as well that don't require as much prep. And again, feel free to steal mine and just modify it any way you like to. That's totally fine. This one is spinning the wheel. So I'm gonna, again, do this so I can actually spin the wheel. Sorry, it's taking a little bit to load. Excuse me. I was in a meeting the other day and we were playing at Kahoot and one of the people in the meeting jokingly put their name as loading, but the poor person who started the Kahoot didn't know that. So they thought we were still loading. It was very silly. Ah, great question. Um, Jennifer asked, how long was each station? Each station there was 10 minutes. And that there is a little 10 minute timer in the lower right hand corner for each station. Excellent question. So this is play, spin the wheel video and press pause, then do the activity associated with the color that is paused. So, oh boy, here we go, spinning the wheel. <gasps> What's it gonna land on? It looks like it lands on three. Oh, I better go to three. Let's go. Okay. Then I would have students drag whatever their spin was to the box, which you can't do if you're you know, presenting like I am, just so I knew which one they did. And then they would either complete the go formative. They, and go formative is awesome. If you haven't checked it out, it's fantastic. I love it so much. Complete their silent sustained reading and then the GIM kit on the silent sustained reading. And then complete the jam board. So, and then do a caption picture retell of what you did. So these are three options students would have. I would do this if I were gonna have something for the first 15, 20 minutes of class for someone to pick. And I would have students probably choose one of the three for this. But you can do it any way you want. You can do it any way that works for you and your students, really. And finally, this one's been a big hit lately. I guess it's mostly with the trading adults, but pirates are always exciting. So, so this is read the chapter of the novella, select a treasure, then complete the activity associated with that treasure. And when I did something like this in class, the students were very active because they're saying, don't pick the one in the tree and stuff like that because they all look alike. So here, uh-oh, create a smash doodle for the story chapter with directions and a rubric here where you go back and let's pick the other one in the tree. Write a tweet, three tweets from the perspective and one or more of the characters from the text, including one hashtag. We've got an Instagram story. Students really like to do fake Instagram stories and there are fake pictures of a lot of the CLC characters that they like to use. Or if I'm teaching Caesar and the Aeneid, there's there are definitely things out there they can use for a fake Instagram story. So it's really fun for them to try to make that and include pictures, descriptions, and our hashtags. And again, they're using Jamboard for that. That's the symbol for Jamboard. This one's watching an Ed Puzzle video. And you could just as easily do this in Go Formative. I think I'm going to transfer a lot of my stuff from Edpuzzle to Go Formative just because I really like it as a system. I can see what they're doing the whole time and see what they answered. And it, I, I can give them feedback as they go. There's a lot of great things about it. And then finally, do a Google reflection form. What did you understand? What did you find challenging? What do you want your teacher to know? I have to say, being a remote teacher this year, Probably one of the most important things I found this year is having students reflect. 
you, I do Google Forms every week for students to reflect, but really just even at the end of a test, I'll say, how are you doing? Is there anything you want your teacher to know? How do you think that went? Just to try to check in with students more often and see how they're doing. Because sometimes when you're socially distanced and when you're on Zoom, it's hard to express yourself. And so making sure I have those connections with students has been very important. So this is my favorite one. Okay, let me close some of these tabs so they're not all over the place. All right. So next. Oops, I skipped one. Hold on. Aha, no, now you skipped forward. There we go. An IPA choice board, which is not a beer. It's not as exciting as it sounds. It's an integrated performance assessment. I've become a little bit obsessed with integrated performance assessments since last year. I did my graduate school homework, uh, graduate school research on homework. And I've always thought that having a choice board for homework would be one of the coolest things ever. And just last year, I started implementing that. So students get to choose what their homework is. And I think it's made a big difference in having students actually complete their homework and get the most out of their homework. And this is something I did last spring where students did this as their final exam. Because we were doing non-traditional final exams, I had students do an integrated performance assessment choice board. But one thing that I really thought was important for my students was to also include, and let me do a present so you can see better, um, to make sure that as I was doing this, I was including an investigative task, something that really had students connecting with the culture, with the history, or for some students really getting involved and building stuff at home and really getting in with that. And so that's been really cool having students do that as another aspect of the, um, the choice board. And so now when I have students do a homework choice board, it's very similar. I'll have them do an interpretive task, an interpersonal task, a presentational task. And then I often add an intercultural task and an investigative task. For an intercultural task, students do something that's interactive with someone else or with the culture somehow. With an investigative task, students investigate the products of a culture. So these are some ideas. Um, feel free to jump through these. I don't want to run out of time. So I may come back to this if I have extra time. But this is something that I think is really fun. Oh, I see a question in the chat. Oh, thanks, Kate. Kate says, I love this. Thanks. I really like this. So feel free to use any and all of this. I have a bunch of these too. If you teach Catullus or Caesar, I've got, I've got a ton. So let me know if that's something that would be interesting to you. I have a book one, Caesar one. I'm coming up with a book four and five Caesar one as well. So, and I have an Aeneid book one. Next is Google Jamboard. And I know Google Jamboard feels like something new. In fact, last year in order to use Jamboard, I had to ask my administration if they would turn it on for our school. And so it feels like something that's very new, but especially with hybrid learning, I have found that it is so helpful for so many things. And I really, really like it. I know they're going to make it more functional too. So, oh yeah, happy to share, please reach out. Um, so here's an ex here are some Jamboards that I've been using. I make a Jamboard for almost every class these days. So especially if you're doing any of this stuff right now and you want copies, if you're in Caesar where I am, if you're in Catullus where I am, let me know, I'm happy to send copies your way. Maureen, I think people might also wanna know how you grade some of these things, if you have any kind of rubric. Or oh, sure, absolutely. For the IPA choice board, I use the actual rubrics for right. interpretive, for yep. interpersonal, for it. Because I basically work backwards from the can-do statements. I know the can-do statements in and of themselves are not kind of grading tools, but what I do is I work backwards and I ask questions. Can you do this? Can you do that? I do a lot of like reflective self-grading, but I also say, okay, here's, I do a single point rubric. So I do, here's what you have to do to meet expectations and do the different questions students have to answer. Good, that's great that you answered that. I do this, I like the, that idea with using the ACTLs because it makes so much sense and you're not trying to sit there and either figure out or justify what you're gonna grade. Exactly, and the students are very clear upfront about what's expected of them. And I think that's really transparency is the key with something like this. And you're reinforcing that same thing because it's always about those things. So it's not, what is she, what is she looking for this time? It's, it's the same things. It's the same thing every time, that's right. So I love Jamboard. 
It's not my favorite. Google Slides is my favorite, but I'm still loving Jamboard. So this is something I did very recently with my students. We did a dinner party. And I've been loving dinner parties since I started teaching because I think it's so fun to have students speak to each other in Latin about things. But you could do this not in Latin. You could do this in English about Latin too. Um, so, oh, come on, load. It's a little bit, I, I put the wonderful mosaic of all the trash from the dinner dining table, but it's, <laughs> it takes a while to load then. So I have jam assignments for different groups. And I also lately have been color coding the sticky notes. So yellow sticky notes have the questions. Partner number one will answer all the questions in the green sticky notes. Partner number two will use the blue sticky notes. And partner number three will use the orange sticky notes. And I will always put the jam assignments on the first jam so that students can go back and reference that. And then when they say, hey, get off my jam, you're on my jam, I'll say, okay, everybody, go back to jam number one, figure out which jam you're on, and then go to that jam. So <laughs> that really helps. Um, and so here I was asking them questions. We were reading Catullus 7 and Catullus 8, and there were a lot of rhetorical questions. And a few of them were saying, oh, I don't remember question words. And by the way, let's go over hyperbole, because I don't really remember how that works either. So <laughs> I came up with questions that had to do with hyperbole and had to do with question words. Um, I think getting feedback from students really, really helps me. And so, and they really appreciated this sort of creepy picture of Ro Roman mannequins in a dining room that would cause a lot of commentary as well that I was not expecting. So here they just answer the questions and they had, they had a lot of fun with this. And it was neat that they got to talk to each other in Latin and then I was monitoring, I was jumping through their little breakout rooms and seeing what was going on. Um, this is something I'm actually making for class tomorrow. Uh, so you get the preview. Um, so this is about finding the person. I found that one of my classes really needs some kind of community connection help. So I want them to go around the classroom and find, and by going around the classroom, I mean pop around Zoom breakout rooms and ask each other, find someone who likes dogs, someone who likes cats, someone who likes snow, <laughs> things like that. And I've done this before in professional development in English, but I think it might be a little more complicated in Latin. But again, I tried to use simple enough Latin that they would understand what I was saying and they could go through and learn a little bit about each other. Oh, Mark says, I need significantly more explanation of what you do in advance and what the students live. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark, I didn't understand your question. Well, I so like those, those sticky notes, like they, they, copy the sticky note and and write on them and move it to a different slide I, like I, I just don't know what so jamboard is is brand new to me i i, oh, I learned okay. about it just recently and sure. it i like google products so i i really wanted to to expand and and i use slides all the time so i i but but the step by step the nitty gritty is just really um un, unclear to me Sure. And if that's out of place in this um, presentation, I can maybe question you afterward. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to show you at least um, what I did here. So this is actually a Word doc that I took a screenshot of. I did this table in a Word doc. Then I put these in here. And then I took a screenshot of it and put it in the Jamboard. Next, I would have students put sticky notes with other students' names on here. So let's say John likes dogs. I'll put John in this box as I'm interviewing. So here's John. He's going to go and say he likes dogs. And let's say that Mary, I have a daughter named Mary Lamb. She loves it right now. Um, let's say that Mary has, she likes snow. I'll put Mary there. And so I would go around interviewing my fellow students until I found one person who matched each of these boxes. And so I would actually make a copy of these for each student. So this is actually a wonderful jam to ask me this question on. So what I would do then is go up here because it's not very intuitive about how to make a copy of each jam. So what I would do up here is I would click these three dots and I would duplicate. And you can duplicate up to 20 jams. You can have 20 jams on a jam board. So this, is a, this particular class has 17 students. So I would want 18 jams plus my directions jam. So this would give directions, which I'd put on a sticky note. 
And then I would probably do jam assignments using sticky notes as well. So I would say, let's say this person's going to be jam number two. And I would drag these around and have students claim a jam once they logged on. That way I know who's not there that day. Jam number three. And so what I would tell students is, okay, when you log in, find a jam. So let's say that Maureen found jam number three and nobody had claimed it yet. So Maureen is gonna go work on jam number three and I would expect Maureen to then write her name on jam number three. So I would know who is working there. But even if she didn't write her name, what I could do is go up here. And as long as she's logged into Jamboard, see that little mm -hmm. icon with the name and the picture, you can see whose jam's on who. So when Johnny complains that Maureen is on his jam, you can take a look and say, oh no, Johnny, actually you're on Maureen's jam. You better get off there. <laughs> uh, so you can see where the kids are at every time. And I think that's super helpful so that I can keep track of who's doing what. And if I have groups working together, I can keep track of which groups are on which jam and make sure, you know, oh, Mark, don't go look at their jam. They have more answers than you. Um, and it's, way, it's like, I can watch what they're doing the whole time. So as a learning curve thing, it might make sense to do a very small one, like four boxes or six boxes and have the kids put themselves just so Mark with his students gets the feel of a jam board, right? And Mark, feel free, yeah, and Mark, absolutely feel free to touch base after this. I'm happy to meet up sometime to chat more with you if you find that this is helpful for you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, let's go to some more. We have, a, I have a bunch to show you. Um, let's see, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're good on time. This is a fun one that I came up with the other day because my students in Latin two were really missing book one. And so we wanted to, <laughs> talk about book one. Oh, it's telling me I'm not in. Here we go. Come on. Oh, of course. I don't know why it logged me out. That's weird. All right, come on. Here we go. So this is something that my students requested and they really need to review prepositions, but they also miss book one. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some oral Latin with them using different prepositions, and then they'll have to move the characters to the different places. And here, one of the things I wanted to point out here was you can order bring to the front. So if, if you're pulling something over here and it's going behind another picture, one of the cool things about Jamboard is you can go to these three dots and you can either bring it to the front or you can move it to the back if that's something you want. Ah, it's not working. Why aren't you going to the back? Send to the back, there it goes. So that's a neat thing about Jamboard and layering things. So I appreciate that. So in oral Latin, I might say, um, pone metellam in horto. And then they have to find Matella and put her in, the, in here. And I would tell them to bring her to the front because this is something we've been working on. I firmly believe when I'm doing tech tools with students, I wanna teach them how to do it too because they'll definitely be using them in other classes and it'll be very helpful for them. So having them develop the skills they need is really helpful as well. And so this is fun and I do, maybe I do something as super hortum or something like that just to get more prepositions in there because that's what they really wanted to review. But I thought that this would be a fun way to do it for them. And again, I would assign one of these, there are 10 students in that class, so I'd assign one jam to each student and they could move the characters around and I'd watch and see what they're doing as they're doing this. This is your class tomorrow. Let me, I'm sorry, I have to close out of this jam because if I don't, my computer will go crazy. Oh, I see a question. These are um, actually pictures I got from Google. <laughs> um, one of the cool things about um, Jamboard is you can't just drag any old picture, but if you do a Google search for a picture, you can drag from the picture search onto the Jamboard. So usually for something like this, I might take a screenshot from Elevate, but for this particular one, I was able to just drag things from Google. But again, feel free to copy this if it's helpful to you. And I'm actually going to go out of every Jamboard because just nota bene here, if you have multiple Jamboards open, the Jamboards are not super happy about that. And sometimes it can make it really slow and laggy. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, 
Next is Greek prepositions. This is something I did with Greek today and they found it a little hard. If you don't know Greek, just enjoy the pretty pictures too. <laughs> um, so what Greek was also reviewing prepositions. And um, first you'll see a fly swatter game that we'll go over in a few minutes. Fly swatter was very fun and I'm very glad I'm not in the classroom because it was, they were very competitive with this. But we're going to go to the pretty pictures instead. So we went over prepositions and then students were dragging. Let me show you. Students had a picture of something and I used different declensions that we've been reviewing recently. So this particular person had ho oikos and they had to use different prepositions to demonstrate what was happening around the house. And this person chose sheep. So she shows sheep doing different things around the house using prepositions. Similarly, this person has the agora. So she's going to use prepositions to show different things happening around the agora. And this is someone who is choosing animals, who's doing it around the city. And um, this is someone who's doing something in Athens. And so this is a fun way for students to be reviewing prepositions. I've done this for years, having students draw these pictures. But since we're in hybrid learning, I wanted to try it this way and see how students did with it. And each of these little prepositional phrases are screenshots that I made of a Word doc. I had a master Word doc that had all the stuff in it. And then I did individual screenshots. So when the student got their, their jam, it just had a list of all of the prepositions with the words. And then they illustrated it. And I've done, like I said, I've done this with students hand drawing it for years that the students said they, re these are my former Latin students, so they really liked doing this in Jamboard. They said it was really fun and gave them an opportunity to do more with it. Yes, students um, pulled the images from Google for themselves, which is very easy in Jamboard. You go to photos and then you can do a Google image search. So this particular person probably said Greek house and wanted to look for it and found a Greek house that they liked. It's very easy and it would insert right in there. So it's super easy to have pictures and to layer pictures to make them come front and back like I was showing. So it's, it's a really cool tool for that. Next, a character jam. This is one I did very recently with my students. We did, we, I had students act out the different scenes from chapter 22, which they had a blast doing. And as I was telling Ginny and Martha at the beginning, it was the first time I'd seen some of their faces without masks in a really long time, and it was really cool. Um, but what I had students do is go on the, their different jams, and then they had to drag the descriptions to the different people. And this was my kind of way of making sure they were, they were paying attention when the other students were acting out their scene. And here, some students really kind of lumped them on top of each other. Some students did more than others because they had limited time. Some did it this way. It's always interesting to see how different students organize different things and kind of learn a little bit about that. Some of them taught me how to organize things better. So that's a fun one to do character descriptions. Another one I've done is what I call a scavenger hunt, which sounds a bit more exciting than it actually is. But whenever I say scavenger hunt, students sound like they're more excited for it. So we'll go with it. And I, like I said, these sometimes take a bit to load. So again, I have um, students finding figures of speech within Catullus 8. And I had jam assignments at the bottom so they would know who they were working with. And here I had students, I had already made the sticky notes that were yellow so that students could drag those on there. But this whole process, I had students using the green sticky notes to ask me questions. And after I, I did this on Monday, and I think after doing this on Monday, I am always going to do that. I'm always going to have a color sticky note where students can ask me questions on the jam because students were great about doing that. And some of the students that wouldn't necessarily type something to me in Zoom were actually using the green sticky notes. So I was like, oh, this is awesome. They'll ask me questions on things. And it was just so easy. And then they were using the orange sticky notes to ask their peers questions, even though they're in breakout rooms, um, which I don't know if I'd do that again. But then they were using the blue sticky notes for unknown words. So I was going through and I was answering the questions on the green ones and helping them out with the unknown vocabulary words on the blue ones. Oh, I see you have a question there. 
Oh, Kate, that's a good question. Can you tell who has written a sticky note? I sometimes I can, and I know who's been assigned to which jam for this particular one. So I know there are two different people probably for each jam. So I'll know it's one of those two. But if I also often have students write their initials on jams. So if they are putting a sticky note on at a jam, they'll write their initial at the bottom of whatever they're writing. So that's something you could implement with your students just so you know who they are. Oh, I see another question. Whoops, I just logged out of that. Ginny, can you grab that question? Sorry. Oh, that's a good point, Kate. I wonder whether the anonymity helps. That's true. That might be useful. You're right. I didn't think about it like that, but you could be absolutely right with that. You know what I also wonder too is if some kids just by the nature of not having to like articulate the question out loud and can just like in the moment if they have a question get it answered or at least get it off their brain can be very helpful to kids I think. Absolutely yeah. I, that's I, I really like the sticky note thing and I'm definitely using it going forward. This was identifying in context we've been working a lot on participles and adjectives basically in the entire green book. So and we're actually doing another thing on it uh, when we come back next week. So it's something we're really working on. And then, so what I did was I, in, even before class, I picked out all of the words that I wanted and I put them on yellow sticky notes. Then I put their forms on other color sticky notes. So students had to find the word and then match it to the form. And so they had a lot of fun doing this and they worked in pairs. And so that always makes things a little bit more fun. Um, some of them had more trouble than others. And actually, um, I think the green sticky notes would have definitely helped here. Uh, so I think next time I would have the opportunity for them to ask questions, but it was something that was fun. And it was something that made them identify grammar and context too at the same time. So that was pretty fun. Okay, here are more games. So fly swatter, like I said, it's very good that we're hybrid because it's got really competitive. Um, one thing I would recommend is if you have extremely competitive students, take some students out of the games to be referees. That's what I've had to do in all of my classes this week. I've had part, some of the students are playing, but I made sure that for each pair that was playing, there was a referee because if not, students were stealing things from each other because they could. Uh, so not because they were trying to cheat, but because they were extremely competitive. And it's interesting, usually I have a reward system for competition, but for this year, I haven't been able to do that because I'm virtual, but I'm finding my students are just as competitive. So for this particular swat fly swatter game, I let them pick what they wanted to swap flies at. This particular person wanted a sword, this person wanted a fly swatter. I said that was fine. So what I was doing was I was reading something aloud in English, and when they heard the word, they would take their fly swatter and put it on there first. Again, this was a class where I had to take some kids out so that we could have judges because students were getting the word so fast. Um, and it was great. This was um, Caesar 4.24 and they were just having a, an absolute blast doing this and trying to get their little icon there first. Then when they captured something, so let's say this fly swatter went in impetum first, then that means that they get to drag the picture of impetum under their name. And as soon as they get 10 pictures, they win. So they, <laughs> then they played someone else. And so we did this for about a half an hour and the students just had a grand old time and they really liked being able to pick their own fly swatter. But be careful, one caveat. I had students who were doing this and so one would go on first and one would go on second and then they would do um, bring to front. <laughs> So that's why we need a referee sometimes. So you, you know your students best, so you know it would work best for them. But I had to say fly swatter on Jamboard was super duper fun. So I would highly recommend it. If you'd like some sort of template for this, let me know. Also allowing students to choose their own thing to swap flies with was really funny. I had a shoe, I had a hand. It was just, it was just silly nonsense. Here's another fly swatter with my even more competitive Greek class. Um, oh no, this is my other Latin class. I thought it was my Greek one. Let's see, we have a question in the chat. So they're all playing at the same time on different jams. Yes, except for the students who I pulled out to be referees. So it was kind of, um, kind of like a bracket system 
where we, we, I kept track of who was playing whom at any given time and made sure that they had a referee for their games. Um, okay, so this is bingo. This is not the other fly swatter. I linked the wrong thing, but that's okay. So I had some examples of hyperbole in song and students were, students had so much fun contributing to this. And then I had examples of alliteration. Students did a really good job with this. Oh, so Jessica, how did I navigate switching partners during fly swatter? I had a notebook where I was writing down everybody's name and who was playing who. That's how I did it. And I told them which jam to go to. So once they won, I would tell them to go to the next jam. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm a Google certified trainer, but I still like all my notes are on paper. <laughs> Sometimes it's the easiest way. <laughs> just how I do things. Um, so this is showing kind of a collaborative one. And it was really, it was really super fun for some of the students to do this. And then we did notes. We were reading um, Catella 7, we were taking notes. This was the coolest part. I picked out things that I thought students wouldn't have a lot of background on, and they did mini presentations. They really took about 10 minutes to do this, but it was super duper cool that they were able to take these things from Catella 7 and look them up and talk a little bit about them. And they had to supply some pictures as well. And so that was really cool. Oh, they loved exclusives of Mator. They thought that was awesome. Um, and Silphium, things they really didn't know about. Then I had students play bingo. And so this was challenging. I've done it with vocabulary, but doing figure of speech bingo, oh my goodness, this was hard. So what I have students do when they play bingo is they have to drag the items to the bingo board themselves. That way every student has a different bingo board because if not, I would have to do all of them myself. And again, this works much better, I have found, when you use just individual vocabulary words instead of phrases, but that's what we did this time. So every time they did something, so let's say they had labellum here and I would call out something in the diminutive, they would cover it with diminutive. And so that was a fun way to do it. And again, takes advantage of a layering. And so what this is, is a word doc where I did a table, I took a screenshot of it, I inserted it. And then these were all the phrases of the poem that I did mini screenshots of and then put them in as pictures. So, so it takes a lot of time, but it was worth it. Maureen, at the end of that, each kid is going to have all their boxes covered with yellow post-its. Mm -hmm. And how will you know that they have them over the right ones? Or will it just be that? Oh, they'll share their screen with me and show me. If they call, if they call bingo. I understand. Oh, so the person who yells bingo will show it to you. Okay. Right. okay. Yeah, they'll do it one at a time. So that could be labor intensive is what I was thinking though, is what I'm. It can be. I think if I do it once, I can do it for all of my students in that group. So okay. like for okay. example, this one's a little, this shows a little bit more of what I end up, have ended up doing with it. That was an earlier iteration of this, <laughs> but it's fun. Experimenting, you learn lots. <laughs> I know we have a couple more minutes, so I'll just show a few more things if that's okay with everyone. So here you drag the Greek vocabulary words onto the board, creating your own unique bingo board. Then as your teacher calls each word, drag that picture that matches each word to match the called words. So then I would delete this. And so for example, fulakes, I would have to look for guards. So I would say, oh yeah, those are the guards. She called Fulakes. There we go. Okay. Or Neis. Oh, where are the ships? Take a look and see if I could find them. Oh, there they are. And so this works a lot better. Yeah, I <laughs> And what I really like about this is when students are finished the bingo game, here they have this beautiful study tool that they were using to study for their vocabulary quiz, which was awesome. And I do vocabulary in context the whole time. So this is them. Um, figuring it out from the story. So that was fun. Let's see. So I know we're running out of time. This is my last thing. So I'm just gonna show one or two brainstorms if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jennifer, did you wanna share your screen? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Jennifer. Sorry, or I could just say the website, but um, I've been using my free bingo cards Mm -hmm. And then I just enter random words in there, whatever sure. words I want to focus on. 
and then it generates a new car it generates up to 30 cards yeah the kids click the link and they get a card and then i can see they don't have to share their screen with me because the actual program i say what's the number on the top of your card and the program wow. shows me the cards and their x's that they put it on very cool oh cool can you share that website please yeah please can you put that in that would be awesome cool thank you So I think some of you might have seen my Google Slides presentation. I've been trying to do the quote game on Jamboard too. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer. She just shared the website. So this was us doing um, a translation of Catullus three, where students were all picking words and putting pictures next to the words that they picked, which was super fun. And then uh, students said what they thought about the poem. Um, some had interesting ideas. He ate the bird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was my favorite. Um, and then the students played the quote game. So each student group had a jam where they had to come up with a quote from either Catullus 1, Catullus 3, or Catullus 2. So for example, an excuse for your teacher, the sparrow is dead. <laughs> a line from an action movie, um, Orcus, qui omnia bella devoratis, <laughs> devoratis, <laughs> written on a gravestone, more to us ask, well, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> personal motto, I had to ask them about these because we had Mali and Tristan, so I said, oh dear, oh fuck to Mali, oh no, we had to talk about those. Or a caption for that picture, which was fun. Um, and yeah, so that was a really fun activity. Um, Very clever. Oh, Scansion, just one more, if that's okay. Absolutely, Scansion, we'd love to see something on Scansion. <laughs> this is something that's super helpful for me. Um, I've been using hexameter.co for a really long time and I was using other things for Scansion, like whiteboard fi and kind of pushing everything to students. But instead, what I've been doing is assigning each student lines. And this was when we were coming back to Scansion after a long time of reading Caesar. And so I had to remind them of all the different rules for Scansion. So I put the rules around and then had students doing the scanning. Nice. It was really fun. And then we did more with it. And the other cool thing, oh, oh my goodness. This is something I will always use from now on. I have students do translations, like practice AP translations. I have the answers hidden behind highlighter. So I've used the highlighter to cover over the answers. So then when students are finished to check their answers, they use the eraser and they can see their answers. Oh, wow. They love this so much. They said it's the most satisfying thing when they're finished to just erase and see their answer. <laughs> so I know it's a little thing, but it's really nice because then students have access to the translations that they've just tried in class. I would give them, you know, 10 minutes to work on this and then they get to check their translation and tell me how many they got right if they wanted to and tell me what they had trouble with. And so again, I've done this for a lot of them and it's super fun. You just use the highlighting function and then they can satisfyingly erase it. <laughs> so that's 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 been super fun. And it's empowering because they get a chance to see what they did wrong without somebody telling them. Exactly. Yes, there are tons of highlighter colors. So I was really boring in using black and white, but you can use lots of different highlighter colors. And the students like using highlighter colors too. They were doing their own too. Um, so thank you so much. I know we ran out of time, but feel free to jump around, check out things. Um, let me know if you want any copies of anything, I'm happy to share a copy with you or you could make a copy for yourself. And again, feel free to reach out. I am, my email is latintechtools at gmail.com. I will get back to you eventually, I promise. And also um, you can follow me on Twitter at latintechtools.